going to tell you a little story about authority. When I was the pastor of Hedgesville United Methodist Church, and Hedgesville was in the news this week, unfortunately, because the man who did the shooting in Sharpsburg, not Sharpsburg, Smithsburg, outside Hagerstown, was from Hedgesville. But Hedgesville is a little tiny town, and there are a lot of churches in Hedgesville. There were four actually on the corners where my church was. And there was one big church in town called the Independent Bible Church. 800 people worship every Sunday, but fewer than 400 members. Because if you wanted to be a member of the Independent Bible Church, you had to give them their W-2 form every year, and they would tell you what your offering was going to be. I'm not making that up. That's given some authority to the church, don't you think? And they were always evangelizing, not among the unchurched, but among the churched. So someone begged a woman from my congregation, you've got to go with me to my church. My church is so wonderful. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. And she went and sat through the service and the sermon. And they left, and they were driving back to her house. And their friend said, I am so sad. My heart is broken. She said, why is your heart broken? What happened? She said, well, didn't you hear the sermon? And she said, yeah, I heard the sermon. Why is your heart broken? The pastor said, we're not allowed to listen to country music anymore. She said, what do you mean? She said, Don't, weren't you there? Didn't you hear it? She said, yeah, I heard it. The pastor said you can't listen to country music anymore. She said, so I can't listen to country music anymore, to which my member said, why would you listen to your pastor? Well, she told me this story, and I said, spoken like a true United Methodist. Why would you listen to your pastor? Authority. Big part of this morning's lesson. Let me tell you how we go about preparing sermons when you're preaching, and this is why I'm only using this one short passage today. How many of you have heard the Great Commission so many times you could probably say it by heart or close to it by heart? It's a big lesson because this is Jesus and Matthew. This is right before his ascension, which Matthew doesn't talk about. But Jesus has the disciples gathered on that mountaintop, and he says to them, what? All authority in heaven on earth is given to me. All authority. So you can look at that. Then there's some of them doubted. You could do a sermon on just the doubting of the disciples. You could do a sermon on baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is not today's lesson, but today is Trinity Sunday. That's all I'm going to say about it is Trinity Sunday, because if I do a Trinity sermon, you all glaze over, and rightly so, because that's a concept that the church tried to help people understand how God interacts with us, and we've kind of just confused a lot of people. So I'm not going to go there this morning. But we're called to baptize people. We're called to go into the world, all those things. But the word that gets me this morning is therefore, ergo, therefore. Because therefore, go into the world. Why? Because all authority has been given to Jesus Christ. All authority. Therefore, this is what you've got to do with that. It's one of those if this, then that sort of statements. My husband was an IT guy, and he used to say if this, then that all the time. And I'm like, I don't care about flow charts. This makes sense to me, this one here. Therefore meaning because this happens, this is what you have to do to respond to it. So if Jesus has all authority and he says go, what are we supposed to do? Some of you aren't sure. It's in there. If Jesus says go and he has all authority, what are we supposed to do when he says go? go. Yeah, you think so, huh? Now he says go to all nations, which to us makes great sense, doesn't it? Because we're used to the whole worldly view. We're talking, this is the first century. There was no airfare, air flights. There was, no, there was no way to get there. There were ships, but they didn't know what the world was at that point. Jesus says, go into all nations, which to us seems like a reasonable thing to do. But you have to remember, this is Matthew's gospel. Matthew was the most Jewish of the gospel writers, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was the one that was very concerned with saying, folks, this is our Messiah, our Messiah, our Messiah. Jesus was always quoting the Psalms, quoting Isaiah more than anything else, any of the other gospels. He quotes the Old Testament for us, the Hebrew Bible. But if it's the most Jewish of Gospels, look at the beginning of it, because he talks about the genealogy, and in Jesus' genealogy, he mentions women who are not of the faith. And then who was it who came to see Jesus when he was born and brought gifts? You remember those guys? The Magi? They were not Jewish, were they? That's all we know about them. We really don't know what they did or who they were or how many there were. We think there were three because they gave three gifts, but there could have been there were more than three, probably. There was probably a whole passel of people traveling together in a caravan. But they're not Jews. That's the one thing we know about them. They bring gifts, and, and then, aha, what do we quote there? But we quote, the wealth of the nations shall come to you, camels and all these wonderful things. So we're going backwards into the Old Testament to see that God says one day, it's going to start with Israel, but one day it's going to go to the whole world. 
Even Jesus heals Gentiles in Matthew's Gospel, which is an unusual thing. We don't have a lot of stories of Jesus healing Gentiles. We have one that really stands out because he heals the daughter of a woman who comes to him and begs him. What does he say to her that just really strikes every time we read it? It is not right to give the children's bread to what, did he say? To dogs, to a woman who comes to him for help. But her answer moves his heart. She says, even dogs get to eat the crumbs under the master's table. And he says, I haven't seen faith like that, and your daughter is healed. But if we're going to go into all nations, that's easier for us than it was for people long ago, but it's what keeps a lot of people from answering a call to ministry because they think they're going to be sent to some place like Liberia where Anna and Nathan are, or Australia even, where Abigail was last year because they even speak English there, but still that's a long way from home, isn't it, to go. So we're not called to do it the way they did in the 18th and 19th century. Have you ever seen photographs of the missionaries going to Africa? What do they immediately do to the women in Africa in most of these really hot places? You'll see them sitting in starched Victorian collars up to here in long sleeves because they were trying to make them like us, look like us and act like us and talk like us and think like us and give money like we give money. Or... But that's not what we're called to do when Jesus says to go into all nations. And when I was... Um, I had a good friend in college, and he worked in Japan for a number of years, and he called me and he said, I'm going to move home next year. You've got to come see me if you want to see Japan. And I went, and between the time I bought my plane ticket and got there, he decided he was marrying a Japanese woman and staying there. But I went and um, found out that in Japan they're sending missionaries to the United States. Think about that one for a moment, because do you know how much of Japan is a professing Christian? What percentage of the population is professing Christians exclusively? Less than 2%. Now, when I was there, I went two times. I went back six months later with a mission group from the Board of Global Ministries of the United Methodist Church. I went there with um, a group, and we traveled around, and I spent a night with a missionary family from Texas by myself when the group had gone on ahead. And they said, you're going to come with us. We're going to go to a wedding chapel. I said, okay, a wedding chapel. Went into a room that looked very much like this with a cross, an altar, Christian symbols. There was a man there getting ready to do a wedding, and he had a stole around his neck and a collar on. They said, he's not Christian. I said, well, why is he dressed like that? And then they took me into the next room where they had the receptions, and there was a big wedding cake, five feet high. And they said, go stick your finger in the cake. I said, I am not going to stick my finger in anybody's wedding cake. And he said, no, you're going to go stick your finger in the cake. He drags me up, and I'm like, no, and he pushed my finger in the cake. Guess what? It was fake completely made out of paper mache and decorated. I said, what is this about? He said, this is because they want to look like Americans. Now, there was a space, a little space for cake. Japanese people do not eat cake. It's not a Japanese thing. There was a piece that was missing that they could put a real piece of cake in so they could feed each other cake for the pictures because they wanted it to be very American. Reminded me when I was there with my friend who was a college teacher. I went to meet with one of his classes. He said, speak very slowly. They'll understand you, even if they pretend not to. And I was like, hello, my name is Carrie. And they'd say, ah, Telesan, Telesan. But he said to them in Japanese, what religion were you when you were born? They all went Shinto, because they have this big celebration for births of children. And at three, five, and seven, you get a big celebration when you're in the Shinto faith. Shinto means the way of many gods. It makes sense. Christians, yeah, we can have Jesus. My favorite Shinto god is the god of breweries because they would have breweries with barrels of beer outside and there would be this statue of a sleeping, because he was always drinking the beer, god of breweries. So for Shinto, Jesus is like that. Then he said, how do you want to be married? They all said, Christian, Christian. I said, why Christian? Because that's the only faith tradition that requires vows between the two. And how do you want to be buried? Buddhist, because that's when you go out in literalist flames. You know, they send you out sort of like Valhalla kind of thing. But they're sending missionaries to the United States because that less than 2% of Japanese Christians, devout professing Christians, are so devout that the nation leaders fear them because they're so powerful, because they give their authority not to the nation but to God. Think about that a moment. Well, we're probably not called to go to Japan or Liberia or Australia or any place else. But I think these days we've got 
other places to go. We've got to go out into the world, and the world is a scary place for a lot of people right now. COVID, it's a different landscape to do evangelization, isn't it? Because people are scared. People have lost folks. John McGuffin's home right now with COVID. I hope he's watching us. John, we're praying for you this morning. Then there's a little bit of political unrest in the country if you haven't noticed that lately. Have you noticed that people can't get along? Have you watched the news? People are being shot all over, not just in schools and churches, but going to work. People are scared. And the, the killings in Smithsburg, it's not a mass mass murder. You know why? Because only three people died. To make a list of over 290 mass shootings in the United States since January 1st, four people have to die. People are struggling right now with illness. They're struggling with inflation, buying gas, getting to work, feeding their children. There's a lot going on in the world, and that's where we're called to go in the name of Jesus Christ into these difficult places. I can't tell you how many people have said to me this week, Friends of mine are in despair. I have no idea what to say to them anymore. Give me words to say that bring hope and comfort and peace. It's a hard world to go into. But I'm sure you know the rest of the saying that the sermon title of the day is the go. And when the going gets tough, what's the rest of it? The tough get going. It's attributed to President Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy's father, Joseph Kennedy. He's the one who said that. Think about that a minute. When the going gets tough, what? Does that mean they retreat? They get going the other way. No, it means you go into the fray. You go into the world that you're called to serve in the name of Jesus Christ with a word of hope, which brings us to the end of that passage that we read today. I'm with you always, always, to the end of the age. I am with you always, 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 always. Christ is with us. Christ is in us. Christ is leading the way. Christ is behind us and before us. The breastplate of St. Francis. I thought about singing that this morning. Christ beside me, Christ below me, Christ within me. But that's the prayer that I used to pray every time I flew. Back in the day when I flew to meetings all the time, I, every time I got in the, the plane started up and the, started to take off, I would say, Christ beside me, Christ beneath me, Christ around me. Christ is with us every moment of our lives. And if we forget that, we will forget what we're called to do in his name. Not to go out and make people like us, but to share the gospel of God's redeeming love in Jesus Christ. They have hope where there is no hope. We're called to do more than that in this passage, aren't we? We're called to baptize. We're called to do everything that Jesus commanded us. Teach them what I commanded you. What did Jesus command us to do? Here's your Bible quiz of the day. What did Jesus command us to do? Hmm? Love God, love our neighbors. Feed my sheep. And this is Matthew's Gospel, remember, the 25th chapter. Jesus says the Son of Man is coming. When he comes, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, and he's going to say to the goats, Get away from me, because I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was this, I was that, I was sick and in prison, and you neglected me. And they said, when do we ever see you, Lord, like that? And he said, whenever you ignored the least of these, you did it also to me. And to the sheep, he says, come into my kingdom, good and faithful servants. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was sick and in prison, and you visited me. And he said, when do we ever see you like that? And he said, anytime you did this for anyone, you did it for me. Oh, Folks, we got some work to do, don't we? We've got some work to do. Now, one thing Epworth does not have is an evangelization, evangelization committee. You know that? There's not one in our ART. No one's represented. So I, I'm going to make a, I'm gonna make a nomination today. I'm going to ask for a nomination from the floor because I'm not allowed to make a nomination. Somebody want to nominate you all to be on the evangelization committee? Nobody's going to do it, huh? Can I get a motion? Well, I'm going to make the motion. I move that you all are on the evangelization committee of Upworth United Methodist Church. Do I get a second? Do I get a second? Oh, my golly. I got a second. All in favor, say aye. You're afraid to not say anything now, aren't you? Jesus says we're going to go into the world and we're going to make disciples. We've got to do that by how we live, how we love, how we forgive each other. It's not enough to just think these things. And, you know, you're all willing to play Simon Says, but are we willing to play Jesus Says, do it, and we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. We've got to do that. We're going to sing 
at the end of the service today a song that I love that some of you won't like because it's going to make you get up and dance and rock and roll and all that kind of stuff. Steve Agrisano, who is a Roman Catholic singer, it's called Go Make a Difference in the World. If you don't get the verses, that's all right. I want you to sing the um, refrain, which is Go Make a Difference, We Can Make a Difference, Go Make a Difference in the World, Go Make a Difference, We Can Make a Difference, Go Make a Difference in the World. I want you to look at the verses. We are the salt of the earth called to let the people see the love of God for you and me. We are the light of the world not to be hidden but be seen. Go make a difference in the world. We are the hands of Christ reaching out to those in need. The face of God for all to see. We are the spirit of hope. We are the voice of peace. Go make a difference in the world. So let your love shine on. Let it shine for all to see. Go make a difference in the world. And the spirit of Christ will be with us as we go. Go make a difference in the world. If you believe Christ is with you, you can do all things. How many of you believe Jesus was raised from the dead? Anybody believe Jesus was raised from the dead? Really believe it. And what is not possible for us to do in his name? How many of you believe he is with us now and always to the end of the age? If you believe it, then live like you believe it and get out there and go. I've told you all so many times I was an English major. Go is that imperative voice that says go. Not, oh, if you, it would be no, so nice if you went. Or maybe you could go if, if, if I asked you really sweetly. Jesus says, get up off your behinds and go. That's a paraphrase, but that's what he means. Go into the world and do these things, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen, amen, amen. Would you please stand and sing?